Well, uh, the topic this morning is rather broad, as perhaps you've already been able to tell from uh, the introduction. Uh, so hopefully, we'll be able to touch on a number of things that will be helpful. But again, by way of introduction, I just want to remind us that of what we've been looking at, okay? We've been looking at Jesus, okay? We, we've, we've seen that Jesus is the eternal Son of God and one who has been loved by his Father infinitely from all eternity. Jesus, again, has been loved by his Father. And when he came into the world, he was loved by the Father. His Father loved and delighted in him on one occasion, calling him his beloved Son in whom he is well pleased. But Jesus sensed the love of his Father throughout his life on earth. We might say that... Um, he experienced the Father's love from all eternity, being in heaven. And even on earth, the Father poured his love out upon him. And we know the Father also anointed him with his spirit above measure, uh, the spirit of love. He poured his love into him, uh, giving him as a man the most ardent love possible for him. So I say all those things simply to say that it's easy to see why Jesus loved his Father uh, the way that he did and why he devoted his whole life to worshiping him, no matter what the cost was to him personally, and why he also loved his neighbor. Okay? Um, man is made in the image of God. We say that man is God's image. Uh, Jesus loved man because he is in the image of God, and he loved him as he loved himself. He honored the authority that, that the Father gave them, knowing it was for his good. He protected the lives of those who were around him, particularly by preaching the gospel. And he safeguarded, as we saw last week, their purity in mind and in heart. Now, we are unlike Jesus in many different ways. We know that we're created, we're not eternal. When we came into this world, we were not holy, but we were unholy, and we know where we were headed. And yet the Father poured his love out on us as well. Uh, he chose us from all eternity. In time, as we've already sung, he sent his Son to save us. And, of course, in order to save us, he also poured his love into us, giving us his Holy Spirit because of the work that Jesus Christ did. And the purpose was that we might believe in Jesus, that we might trust him, but also that we might be transformed into his image, that we might love God and love our neighbor in the same way that Jesus did. Now, the point of what we're looking at this morning is we need to remember all those things because that's our motivation. God has saved us from the pit of hell. He's given us this glorious future in heaven and all because of his grace. And what we ought to do in return, of course, is love him. And that is, I think, what we all desire to do. And the way we love him is the way Jesus loved him. And that is by keeping the commandments because they are the law of love. Now, having looked at the first seven commandments, this morning we're going to consider the eighth commandment. And I would summarize this commandment by saying it is a commandment to love God and our neighbor with our wealth. Another way of putting this is simply to be faithful in the stewardship that our Lord has given to us. Now, on the face or on its face, the Eighth Commandment is actually quite simple. Okay? It states, you shall not steal. It tells us not to take anything that does not belong to us. And I think we understand, <laughs> we understand what that means quite clearly. Um, you know, just a couple months ago, I served on a jury where we were hearing a case of the breaking of this commandment. A man was accused of robbing a delivery man at gunpoint and then at knife point, threatening his life if he didn't hand over his merchandise and any money that he had. Now, this, this is the most obvious way that the commandment can be broken. You know, stealing, it's not always armed robbery, but in this case it was. But stealing, theft, robbery. But we understand that there are many more subtle ways that we can steal from others. And I just want to give a few examples. And forgive me, I'm going to give you a lot of personal examples because, uh, you know, the, these are things that go on all the time. Okay? We can also can break this commandment when we're hired to do a job, but we take longer to do that job than the job should take. Okay? I hope you understand the connection there. 
And let me just give you an example of something that happened in the history of the church. One time the trustees, you know, we were looking at the building, this was years ago, and we were looking at different things that needed to be repaired, pretty, some pretty significant things. So we hired a man to do it who was a professing Christian. And he gave us an estimate, but he kept dragging his feet. He kept milking the job, taking longer and longer. When the, the amount that we had paid him had already gone beyond double his original estimate, we finally had to fire the man because he was stealing from us. We told him that um, we had given him all that we were going to give him, and that was it. We had to find somebody else to finish the job, okay? We can steal from other people when we don't keep up our commitment to do a job for the amount that, that we agreed to do the job. You know, we, we know it's always best to get an estimate that the business is willing to stand by before the work begins. We did in that case, it still didn't work out for us, but even if they do stand by that estimate, you can still, I mean, they can still rob from you, they can still steal. And here's another personal example of how this uh, was violated by a particular company that, that Don and I hired to do some uh, HVAC work for us at home. Uh, they advertised a no-sting policy, and what they meant by that is that um, we're going to give you an estimate, and regardless of how much it costs to fix your unit, we're going to fix it, and we're not going to go over that amount. We're not going to go under that amount, but we're not going to go over it. And what we didn't realize when they gave us the quote was that the quote was inflated and the stinger was actually in the quote, okay? So even though technically we paid no more than the estimate, the company still stole from us because they charged us far more than that repair should have cost. Now, we break this commandment as well when we sell something for more than it's worth. By the way, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, you know, you can also... Uh, and just, you know, just think about this. Uh, I've heard of cases where somebody goes to a garage sale and they see somebody selling an old guitar. Happens to be, you know, uh, maybe a, a golden age Martin and the person doesn't know what they have. You know, they're only selling it for 100 bucks and it's worth maybe 50,000 bucks. So the person buys it for $100, okay? Is that, is that the right thing to do? Uh, to take it from this person knowing that they're giving you this you know, this guitar that's worth so much more than that? Well, we can break this commandment when we sell something also for more than it's worth. Uh, again, here's another personal example. Years ago, I worked for a company that installed water softeners, okay? We, we installed water softeners for another company that was selling water softeners. Now, those salesmen were selling those water softeners anywhere from $1,800 installed. We're talking about a long time ago by the way, about 40 years ago. They were selling for $1,800 up to about $3,400 installed. And by the way, installation might take four hours. Well, one day I was sent to Orange County to pick up some of those water softener units from the company that was selling them to these salesmen. And I had a chance to look at the invoice to see how much these things really cost. $250. So they were selling a $250 unit for a minimum of $1,800 all the way up to $3,400. They were making quite a markup and the, the salesmen were pocketing quite a bit of that money, but the salesmen and that company were stealing from their customers. Now, we know that a company needs to make a markup. They need to make a profit, but I think there has to be a limit to that. You know, it's not anything goes. There's what's called something reasonable, you know, just waits is what uh, the Bible talks about. By the way, Dick, there's another example. There's actually several examples in this sermon of how we look at the Old Testament, just waits, you know, not ripping people off and in selling them the product, you know, but we give them a just amount or the, the right amount for the right, you know, what we're telling them that we're selling them. And we can steal when we take longer on our breaks, on our job than we should. Now, it's true that there are some employers that really don't care how long we break for as long as we get our work done. Uh, another personal example, Don and I worked as custodians when we were in college. And the supervisor told us that if we could get our work done early, we could use the extra time to do our study. And so, you know, we, we just worked through the, that time frame and were able to recoup maybe an hour, an hour and a half to, to do that. But there's others who want you to stick to the schedule. And if you don't stick to the schedule, then you're, again, stealing from the employer. 
We can steal if we borrow money. And we don't pay that money back when we agreed, you know, under the terms of the agreement. Again, another personal <laughs> illustration. One time I, I sold a motorcycle to a friend. And we agreed that he would pay so much money per month for that, for that motorcycle. And uh, I held on to the pink slip, but I gave him the motorcycle. But guess what happened after he got the motorcycle? He didn't want to make the payments any longer. So, again, it just never, never loan money to a friend. Because uh, when they don't pay back, that creates a lot of stress. We steal if we agree to do a certain job for a certain amount, but we don't complete that job. Okay, that happens as well. We know a family where uh, the family hired a man to build a fence. And the man was in the process of building the fence. They gave him a deposit. But then before the fence was finished, the, the, the fence builder came to the family and said, uh, could you pay me the rest of the amount? I realize I'm not done, but can you pay me the rest of, of the, the cost of the job because I need the money to start another fence job for someone else? And so, unwisely, they, they paid the person the money that, um, for a job not done. And guess what happened to the guy who built the fences? He disappeared. They couldn't get a hold of him anymore, and they couldn't get him to, to finish the job. So that man ripped them off. He, he stole from them. Uh, by the way, we need to be re reminded, never pay for the work until it, the job is completed. I think it's okay to give a deposit. But don't pay for the full job until all the work is done. There, there are so many ways to steal. But stealing injures our neighbor, which is why the Lord forbids it. We're to love our neighbor. And that's also why our Lord Jesus, of course, never broke this commandment. But again, we can state this in a more positive way. This, and I think if we do that, it shows us more of what this means because this isn't just a commandment not to steal. This is a commandment to acquire wealth in the way that God would have us to acquire it, not by stealing, but rather by working hard and by investing, okay? Um, all right, so the first way is through hard work. Now, the wisest man who ever lived apart from the Lord Jesus warns us against being lazy in Proverbs 6, verses 9 through 11. You know, the, uh, the word for that is, is to be a sluggard. Okay? And he writes this, How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? And then quoting the sluggard, he says, A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. I, you know, I'm just resting for a little while. I'm not, you know, this, this isn't going to be a, a habit. But then he, he gives the result of that. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. If you were lazy, if you don't work hard, you are going to become impoverished. So what is the solution? The solution is not to be lazy, but to work hard. So he writes, or continues, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. Now, the one reason, I think, one of the reasons why, or let me say two reasons why Solomon points to the ant is because the ant is, is a very hard worker, very industrious. But secondly, because there's nobody standing over the ant, okay, to make the ant work. The ant is just simply doing this because that's its nature. Solomon is telling us that we need to work hard and we need to be self-motivated in, in that work. We need to keep ourselves moving or working hard, even if somebody isn't standing over us to make us do it. You know, Jonathan Edwards, uh, who is admirable at so many different points, uh, realized this early in his life, I'm sure be before he even wrote this, but in his sixth resolution, he writes this, Resolved to live with all my might while I do live. He wanted to get the most out of his life, and he realized the only way he could do that was by working hard. You know, he had other resolutions where he said, resolved, you know, not to lose one moment of time, but to improve it to its best use for God's glory. Okay? So he wanted to invest his life, his time in the kingdom of heaven by working hard. So this commandment tells us we need to work hard if, if that's where we're at in our particular point of life, you know, we may not be working for 
um, for our livelihood anymore if we're retired, but that doesn't mean we still can't work for God's glory. But those of us who may be still in that particular phase, we realize, first of all, as husbands, we need to work hard in our vocations. Paul writes to the Colossians, and here, even though we may not be slaves, if we're hired by somebody else, we become their servant for the time in which we're working. But Paul writes to the Colossians, slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. So Paul's telling us here when we're working, we're actually working for two employers, aren't we? We're working for the person who hired us, but we're also working for the Lord, which means we need to do our best, which is, again, why Edwards did what he did. Wives, you know, you have a job to do as well. You're to work hard in the home to care for your families. But the Proverbs 31 woman reminds us as well that if you can manage those responsibilities and still have the time and energy to pursue a business or a vocation, that too is commendable in the Lord's eyes. But again, we have our primary responsibilities and we're to work hard in those things. Work, if we're single, still need to work to take care of our own needs or maybe to prepare to take care of a family. The Lord should give us a spouse. Well, investing is another way to increase wealth that our Lord actually commends to us. Remember in the parable of the talents. Now this, it comes in the scathing condemnation of the lazy servant, but in it, our Lord tells us we can invest. That's the right, a good thing to do. In Matthew 25, verses 26 and 27, the master says to his lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed, then you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Now, if that were an immoral thing to do, Jesus would not have put that in the mouth of the master. But this is a way we can invest. You know, we can make more money through investment. Now, Jesus tells us that we're not to loan money at interest if that loan is for something that's necessary like food or clothing, you know? That, that's where he condemns usury and interest. In that case, we, are need, we need to give the person who is in need what they need freely and not expect anything in return. Just as Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Plain from Luke 6 in our meditation, we are to be like our Heavenly Father and be merciful and, and gracious and give. But we may loan money at interest to those who are using that money to make more money, and hopefully we'll, we'll do it with an institution that's going to do it in a legitimate way, like a bank, okay? People borrow money to buy a house, and they pay interest on it. They're using the bank's money for that interest. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so we can gain wealth by investing our money and making interest on that. So this commandment tells us not only that we are not, not to steal, but also that we are to gain our wealth in, in a good way, in a righteous way, in a way that's pleasing to God, hard work and investment. But we know the commandment also tells us that what we do for ourselves, we can also do for our neighbors. Now, we're not to take away their possessions, but what this commandment is telling us to do is to help them keep what they have and, and to increase what they have, you know, protect their wealth. Maybe give them some advice. <laughs> Another personal example, one night at three o'clock in the morning, I woke up and for, for some reason, I decided to look out the window and I saw somebody who was stealing the wheels on my neighbor's car. So I called the police. You know, I didn't go out and accost them with a weapon, but um, I called the police. That's what we're supposed to do, to try to protect my neighbor's possessions. And uh, thankfully, somebody had called him before I did who saw that, and the police were able to catch him and get the, uh, the wheels back. If we see our neighbor's dog, <laughs> you know, loose, and the dog is a friendly dog, you know, not a, not a vicious dog, 
we need to catch the dog and take it back to the person. Uh, one time Don and I were working at, at a high school and we saw a stray dog that was running around and it was friendly, so we decided to corral it and keep it. And uh, eventually, well, we found on that one occasion where, where the dog belonged because there was an address on its tag. So we, we took the dog over to the house after we were done with our shift. It's not hard to do. Uh, actually, here's another example. We were talking about uh, Deuteronomy as we're looking at Deuteronomy. And the question came up, is there anything in the book of Deuteronomy beyond the obvious that we're to be doing today? Well, here's another example. Uh, Moses writes in Deuteronomy 22, verse 1, You shall not see your countryman's ox or his sheep straying away and pay no attention to them. You shall, shall certainly bring them back to your countrymen. Now, that's his wealth getting away, his means of, of labor, you know, the, the um, ox, or the sheep, which is a part of his wealth, both of them are really, don't, you know, protect his wealth, bring it back. But, I mean, the dog, I think, could be, could be you know, seen in the same way as well. It's, it's something of value to your neighbor, and so we should try to protect it for our neighbor. And we can help them maybe increase their wealth if we have the opportunity, maybe um, encourage them to budget so they don't spend frivolously or give them advice on, on investing. We've got to be careful about that one but pointing them in the right direction, maybe to somebody who really can help them, maybe somebody who's been of help to us. So anything we do for ourselves, we can also do for our neighbor, and, and we should do that. And then finally, having gained this wealth, we need to be careful to use it to honor God because what we have, He gave to us, again, as a stewardship, it really belongs to him and not to us. And one day, we're going to have to give an account. Now, we have to give an account of our time. We have to give an account of our strength. We have to give an account of our gifts. We have to give an account of how we used what the Lord has given to us and whether we used it faithfully as his steward. Okay? Remember again the parable of the talents. Now, yes, we are to use it to care for our family's needs. We need to provide for them. We need to clothe ourselves. We need to feed ourselves. But this commandment tells us that we are not to do it extravagantly, to live wastefully. Okay, one of James' indictments against the rich is that they did exactly that. In chapter 5, verse 5, he says, You've lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter, okay? Um, what he's telling them is you, you've been too self-indulgent. That's what to live luxuriously means, to, be, to live extravagantly. Uh, I know somebody personally, um, somebody that I've known for many years, who likes to spend money, and his monthly budget is, I would say, extravagant, um, $60,000 a month. Um, that, that's a lot of money. You know, some people don't even have that much to live on in a year. Um, we have to be careful because we're not to live extravagantly, but Paul tells us that we are to live modestly. He writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 7 through 10, For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge, plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I hope you see the point there. Um, one thing that we need to be reminded of, again, Thomas Brooks in his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, Satan will attempt to paint the pursuit of riches as something virtuous and the use of them on ourselves as, as something that's necessary and good. But that's where we need to compare what we hear him telling us versus what the truth is. Um, we are not to pursue riches in and of themselves. If, if the Lord blesses us with riches, I think it's so that we might use these things, not just for ourselves, but also for others. 
So what are some of the other ways that, that we are to use the excess more than what we need to live on? Well, we know the Lord wants us to invest in His kingdom. Um, by giving things away, remember, this is how we invest um, in our in eternal inheritance. It's how we store up riches in heaven, um, as our Lord tells us we should in the Sermon on the Mount. And one of these ways is by giving back to Him a tenth, uh, what, which is what a tithe is. Okay? I, I know the word tithe is kind of bannered about is if I give, I'm tithing. But that isn't necessarily the case. Tithing means a tenth. A tenth of what the Lord gives to us, we give to Him. And that's the example we see in Scripture, um, both before the law and after the law. And we might say, not, we don't see it specifically in the New Covenant, but we, we don't see it abrogated either. But let me give you some examples. Remember when um, those kings came and took Lot and and everything Lot possessed, and out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then Abraham formed his coalition and went after them, and he defeated them. And then when he comes back, Melchizedek comes out to meet him. Well, Abraham gives to Melchizedek, God's priest, a tenth of the spoils that he gained by rescuing Lot, and the reason was because the Lord had given him this victory and this increase. So he gave him a tenth. Well, where does that idea come from? Somehow it seems to be something they understood of what the Lord wanted. When Jacob went to Paddan Aram to find a wife, he made the Lord this promise in Genesis 28, verses 20 through 22. If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, I brought up these examples simply to say that this tithing was something that was going on before the, the giving of the law. But it was also incorporated into the law as a means to provide for those whose full-time occupation it would be to serve the Lord. And I think we're all familiar with that indictment that the Lord gives His people for, for their failure to do this through Malachi the prophet. Now, you're especially familiar with this if you're reading the Bible with us together because this is one of the books that we need to read. Maybe we haven't gotten there because it's the last book of the, uh, the Old Testament. But this is what the Lord says through Malachi. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And what the Lord means by that, of course, is when we don't give what the Lord calls us to give, we're taking from Him, okay? But He also notices, promises to bless them if they will. The whole point is, <clears throat> God doesn't need their money, but He does want their obedience. And if they're obedient, He will bless them. He says this in chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. By the way, as I'm reading these passages, I'm thinking, you know what I sound like? <laughs> I sound like one of these health and wealth gurus that are using passages like this to, to milk God's people constantly. And this is one of the reasons why I don't bring it up very often is because I don't want to be perceived in that way. But we do need to understand this is what the Lord tells us. This is the way to the true riches that God has for us, storing up riches in heaven, but also multiplying what we have on earth. Now, the reason why God wants the tithe is because this is how the work of God's kingdom is financed. This is how it moves forward in, in general. Um, Again, and let me just say this, that um, uh, when we do these things, uh, we need to remember that God's going to reward us and that, and I've, I've said this before and I, it, it kind of struck me again because it is true. Think about everything that you have in the world right now. Think about what's going to happen to it after you die. By the way, are we going to die? Okay, all of us are going to die. And we're not going to be able to take it with us, right? So what's going to happen to everything we have? 
Somebody else is going to have it. You know, I have a guitar that I like to play. What's going to happen to that guitar after I die? Well, somebody else is going to have that guitar, and they're going to play it. Now, what if I want to take some of these things with me? You know, how can I, how can I do it? Um, well, we know that we can't take the possessions, the money. We can't take uh, the material objects with us. But we can use our situation on earth right now to improve the rewards that we're going to get in heaven as Jesus says, store up your treasures in heaven. And the way we do it is by giving, okay? By being faithful to use what the Lord has given us in our stewardship to finance the kingdom of heaven. That's one way. But again, by taking care of our families, by doing whatever he calls us to do, there's a couple of other ways. Let me just bring them up real quickly. Um, the Lord commands us to pay taxes. <laughs> and that's always a popular subject, I know. But Jesus says in Luke 20, verse 25, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But he also says, And to God the things that are God's. Okay, so we talked about that. But give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And what is it we're supposed to give to him? Well, Paul writes in Romans 13, verse 7, Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Do you know if we cheat on our taxes? We're stealing from God, not just the government, because God has ordained that the government be financed through taxes, and if we don't pay the taxes, then we're stealing ultimately from God. Now, I know that we balk at the thought of paying taxes. You know, nobody likes to have to pay taxes, but we, we do need to understand, one, this is how God ordained government be supported, but two, we're concerned about how the government uses our money. You know, we don't like the way our government uses the money normally. But remember, we're not responsible for how our government uses the money. You know, we try to influence how they use it through our votes. We can do that. And through our prayers, certainly how to do that. But ultimately, they are responsible for how they use this money. They are going to have to answer to God. And let's not forget that when Jesus and Paul said that, you know, their hearers to their hearers, they should pay taxes, don't forget who was getting those taxes. Okay, the Roman government and Caesar. So we are to pay taxes. Finally, we need to give to the poor. Okay, now here we need to be careful. You know, Jesus does say, "Give to all who ask of you," and and we need to be, you know, we need to be sensitive to that. But we're not to give to just anyone who asks us. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in Second Thessalonians, three verse ten. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. So don't give them your money. Don't even give them food. Let their hunger drive them to work. We're not supposed to support people who can support themselves. They're supposed to be working. And what we need to do is help them work. Remind them of the responsibility, maybe help them find work. But the ones we are to help are those who are really destitute, okay? James tells us in James 1, verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. In those days, those who were absolutely helpless were the orphans and the widows. You know, they didn't have, they didn't have the economy we have with jobs for women, uh, so they, they needed support from family. Uh, they needed support from, um, well, from having a husband for the widow. Uh, orphans needed a family to support for them or to help them. Um, we don't have that exact problem today, but we do have another problem, and that is we have a lot of homeless people all around us. What do we do about them? Well, again, we can help them. But I think we shouldn't just give out money or even food just willy-nilly because a lot of these people are on the street because they don't want to work or because they're so, you know, addicted to, to drugs that they can't work and they don't want to work. All they want to do is get high, right? So we don't feed the addiction. But here's another thing we need to think about too. Our government, again, is using our money, our taxes, to provide all these different services and, and means to help people who are financially challenged. 
So in a certain sense, we're already paying for that through taxation and through the hidden tax of inflation. So if we want to help people who are in need, and we should want to if we have that ability, then we, we may need to look outside of this country to maybe another country. There's lots of needs in other countries that don't have the programs that we have. Maybe the organi organizations like Come Over and Help. Uh, there's, you know, we, we received their newsletter. You'll find it back there in the uh, missions material. Um, they're helping the poor in the Ukraine. And there's many other, you know, missionary endeavors. I, I would suggest you, you know, use one that's a Christian, um, you know, organization that's going to give them the gospel as well. That way, you know, you, you're really benefiting them in two ways, but you can, you can also use others that are doing this. But we ought to be helping those that can't help themselves. I mean, our problem as Americans typically is uh, not that we don't have enough to eat, it's that we're eating too much, you know. We should think about <laughs> helping other people. Uh, I remember as a child, another personal illustration, uh, my mother used to tell me when I didn't want to finish everything on my plate, <laughs> Think about all the starving children in the world, you know? You really ought to be thankful for what you have. And, and she was right. But the first thing that occurred to me was, you're right, there are people who are starving. How can we get this to them, you know? <laughs> well, we, we can't literally take that plate, but we can give money to, um, to help support organizations that are feeding people who are destitute. Because I think it's still true that in different places of the world, there are people who are dying of starvation. Children, you know toddlers, infants, whose stomachs are bloated because they don't have enough to eat and um, they're going to die. You know, I don't think we have that necessarily in this country. It may be, but um, there's plenty of need out there. So we need to be mindful of that. Now, one thing too, you know, the media, because we have so much communication with different parts of the world, this wouldn't even have been possible in first century Judaism, but it is possible today. So we're aware of much more. So the, you know, the opportunities are much greater. But let me just close on this reminder. As the Lord promises to bless us, if we will be faithful in our, in our tithing and in our investing in the kingdom of heaven, so he gives us a promise here as well. Solomon writes in Proverbs 19, verse 17, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his good deed. You see, if we're aware of a need, we have the ability to meet that need, but we do nothing to meet that need, we're, we are stealing. But if we will listen to what God tells us and invest, the Lord says he's going to repay us. We're, we're, we're giving to the Lord when we give to the poor, and the Lord's actually going to give back to us. And actually what the Lord gives back to us is going to be much better than what it is we're giving in the first place. He's going to give us more. We don't give to get more, but when we get more, and I think the Lord gives those who give more, more, because he knows they're going to give more. <laughs> so, yeah, I, heard, I remember this, this one story. Maybe somebody can remind me of the details later about a man who had a company, and he said, I'm going to live on just X amount of money, and whatever I make beyond that, I'm just going to give to the Lord. And this company prospered, and it made, I think, millions of dollars, but while it did, he continued to live on that small amount of money that he said he was going to live on, and he gave the rest to the Lord. The Lord continued to bless him, and he was able to do so much with the money that God gave to him. I really think that that is, is what will happen if we will simply trust the Lord and, and give to these needs. So the Eighth Commandment calls us not only not to steal, but to gain wealth through hard work, through investment, and then use that wealth to care for our own needs, to care for or to provide for the needs of the kingdom of heaven, even to support the government, the state, but also those who are poor. And again, the Lord tells us if we will do that, he will bless us. So may the Lord give us grace to love him uh, through the stewardship that he has entrusted to us. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us do that.